welcome to the grid. You're just thinking about winning a race. Nineteen eighty three was a make or break season for me. We started the season struggling to find money and somehow Eddie and the rest of us got it together. We, we found enough money to do twenty two races. So I ended up against this great man called Ayrton Senna, but I was fighting to save my career. I quickly learned just how good Ayrton was, how fast he was, and his knowledge, his confidence. How did he know that? Why didn't I know that? I saw so many things in F3 that I would see again in Ayrton's Formula One career. There's no doubt that karting and junior formula racing shapes your personality, shapes your skills and your speed before you arrive in the spotlight of Formula One. In the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, British Formula Three was considered absolutely the number one championship outside of Formula One, I dare say. The Formula One team bosses, team owners, when they had a weekend off, very often they would come to see the Formula 3 race because they knew that's where the next level of talent was going to come from. All the talented youngsters wanted to go to Formula 1. That was the ultimate goal. The question is, how do they get there? You started with Formula Ford, you went up to Formula 3, then Formula 2, and then to Formula 1. People watched the British Formula 3 Championship. They watched who was coming out of there, and they knew those were probably going to be the guys that would go on to do something special. So if you went into F3, like Ayrton or Martin or Alan or Davey, they were dead serious. That was their big chance to show what they could do and make the jump. So because of that, there was enormous pressure to succeed. You typically didn't get a second chance or a third chance. I mean, Martin was in his second year. A lot of pressure on Martin. He had to perform now, otherwise it was probably over in terms of making it up to Formula One. Uh, for myself, I'd only done a season and a half, really, of car racing. So it's still early, but you still have to make it happen now. Uh, European race driving is a, is a higher level than what it is uh, in North America. I think it still continues to be certainly back there. It was, I came across from Formula Atlantic as a champion and race winner and a, a front running driver. And when I arrived, I was a midfield driver at first. And of course, very frustrating to be running midfield. Arriving in, in England, you know, I felt confident within myself as a driver because, you know, I did very well uh, in the States as won, won championships and won a lot of races, set some track records. Um, you know, and they, they kind of queued me up to, to as the young American coming to uh, to England to, to race in the British Formula 3 Series. Um, so I didn't really feel the pressure. I mean, I was 19 years old and, and uh, you know, it's it's like I was I was doing something that I absolutely you know enjoyed doing. It came natural to me. Formula Three at the time was uh, it was an open technology formula. You could run any chassis you liked, any engine you liked, as long as they complied. Obviously, the tires were controlled. Um, but most people went for a car built by Rolt, a company set up by a guy called Ron Torinac, an Australian who was a fundamental part of the Brabham Formula One team during the 60s and until the early 70s. And Ron had gone off to do his, his own thing. And um, in Formula Three in the early 80s, for quite a few seasons, everybody ran Rolt RT3s. It was, it was the car to have. 
single-seater racing has, has always been the same. It doesn't matter how good a driver you are. If you haven't got a car that's good enough to win, you won't win, and vice versa. Uh, if you were somebody like Senna and you had the money, you could get someone like Dick Bennett, who was the top man in Formula 3, uh, to look after you, and that's what Senna did. I think in any era of motor racing, there is as much competition amongst the team owners as there is amongst the drivers. And back there in 1983, it was no different. The three principal team owners were Eddie Jordan, Dick Bennett, and Neil Trundle. Now, Dick Bennett came from New Zealand. He was just a humble mechanic initially, but very, very focused, very determined. He wanted to reach the top of the sport. He made sure he had all the best drivers to, to work with, uh, and so that would reflect well on everybody. Neil Trundle was a very similar sort of character. He, he was a mechanic as well. He worked with Ron Dennis for many, many years. And when Ron set up Project 4 with Crichton Brown and, and headed towards Formula 1, Neil wasn't quite he wasn't quite ready to, to, to continue you know, onto that level. He wanted to run his own team. He said he thought you know, he could do just a job as, as good a job as Ron and maybe become a rival team owner down the road. Eddie Jordan, boy, he was completely different. Eddie started off as a driver. He was a bank manager initially in Ireland, uh, raced in Formula Fords, had a huge crash in Formula Fords, raced in Formula 3 um, himself, and then decided that yeah, perhaps he wasn't quite uh, Formula 1 material as a driver, so, but he was a real wheeler dealer. I mean, he was great at putting deals together, so he became a team owner uh, and uh, then began one of, the, one of the great rivalries, I think, in Formula 3. It was not obvious who could actually, or it was obvious who could not speak to Dick Bennett about driving for him. There was like three or four potential candidates every year, and uh, it was a great honor even to be in, in that little group. And it was, he was able to, pick exactly the driver he wanted and obviously in 83 he picked Atom and that was an obvious choice. Um, Dick, Dick was totally, totally focused 24-7. Um, good mechanic but very good at setting the car up. I don't know why but he had a magic touch. But also he, he did, he had an eye for drivers as well. So, um, or let's say you see, success breeds success. So every year, if he won the championship, the next year, the driver with the budget went to him. I think the, one of the differences was our focus and ability on the engineering front, not so much on commercial, because, you know, I always thought success would bring the money. Sometimes it did, sometimes it doesn't. You still need to have a good commercial person behind a company. I think if I'd stuck with Ron Dennis, I probably would have learned a lot more on the commercial side because Ron, you know, uh, I watched him progress from the three years I worked for him to become to where he is now. Um, but also you have to be happy in your own mind of what you're doing. And I've always been happy on either engineering myself or overseeing engineers and R&D, research and development, is another area that really interests me. At that time, um, my skills were much more so in the commercial uh, and the administrative side of things and psychologically with the drivers rather than the engineering side, which was very much Dick Bennett's uh, modus operandi. And, and, and he was brilliant at that. You would see the lights on the garage. You know, people used to be envious 11, 12 o'clock at night before the night of the race and the lights would be on and they'd be tinkering. Dick Bennett for sure would find something to do with the car, whereas we believed in the opposite and that is get the work done uh, as, uh, as well as you possibly can, but no dilly-dallying, try and be finished out of there at seven o'clock, um, a drink perhaps, um, and early to bed, but with a decent meal. The, the, the two teams were completely diametrically opposed. I think that uh, Dick wanted to win the championship with Ayrton, and uh, I think Dick always wanted to continue operating a, a good team in, uh, in the British Formula 3 championship. Eddie always had aspirations of you know, taking his team up the ladder to, to Formula 1. He's very good at, at talking to sponsors and, and coercing sponsors to, to join him one way or another to support Martin and support his uh, team. But he was a racer and he was hungry and he wanted Martin to beat Senna also wanted me to do well and he'd spend a lot of time really trying to pump me up and push me to do well 
of course, there are a lot of people that have different views and a lot of different successful people, but racing is a very hard nosed cutthroat business and it's not the nicest guys that, uh, that make it to the top. And obviously Eddie, uh, he ran the team very well and uh, he got the money in, but uh, he, he also had a, you know, he had to hire a very good engineer, which was Alistair, Alistair McQueen. Well, Eddie Jordan Racing was, was a very small outfit. It started with Eddie and myself in a lockup in Silverstone with a couple of trestles and a piece of chipboard for a desk. And that's, you know, that's where it grew from. You have to remember that Ayrton Senna was very much a driver in demand. Eddie Jordan had picked him up uh, during the middle of the summer of 1982 when Ayrton was dominating in Formula 4 2000. Uh, Eddie was based, there were lots of, it was like a cottage industry all the way around Silverstone, these little workshops with two or three people working for each team. And Ed, Eddie had one of those and um, he had a Formula 3 team at the time, which was a couple of years old. And when he saw a chance to test out, and he, he grabbed it. That test in Silverstone turned out to be uh, quite remarkable because um, we had been on pole for the previous race, which was at that track only a few days beforehand. And the boy who came, the silver to drive the car, was as quick as that within 15, 20 laps. So I realized this one was very special. It was a real eye opener. Within 20 laps, he took the car around Silverstone Club Circuit as quick as anybody had taken a car around there and then proceeded to tell us how we could improve the car to uh, increase his performance and the car's performance. He said that the car was really good in high speed turns and we got the aero and the, the pitch of the car really set nicely, but we needed to improve the mechanical grip at the front of the car for the entry into Beckett's and for Woodcut Corner. And this is from a guy who stepped into the car half an hour previously. So he was very special. There was a bit of a war off the track over the winter to, to get out and because he was the driver that I think everybody wanted. Um, Dick Bennett's had the advantage, I think, in that he'd, he'd won Formula 3 championships before. He'd won it with Stefan Johansson, he'd won it with Jonathan Palmer, and he'd come close in 82 with Kiki Mancia. That gave Dick a slight edge. And then an opportunity came up at the end of 82. So we entered this non-championship race at Thruxton, and he pole position first, fastest lap, and I think he won by 13 seconds. So the sky's worth having. But Eddie was hovering around offering him all sorts of deals and I'm not a wheeler dealer. I said, there's the deal, that's what we can do for you. And um, Ed and shook hands there and there. I tried desperately to sign him for uh, the 83 season. That wasn't possible. Uh, he went to a much more experienced and uh, a more recognised, talented team, Dick Bennett. Actually, I tried to get Ayrton in my team, but I didn't have a good enough pedigree in 82 to get him. We went back a long way. Uh, he was uh, a dear friend of Chico Serra's. When he first arrived in England, couldn't speak any English. He came to Project 4 workshop and uh, Chico said, this is Ayat and Senna da Silva. He came with his wife. He's going to be a future world champion. When we went into 83 for it, and it was obviously the next platform, it was just the next step towards Formula One. He'd already won his first Formula Three race. He was going places. He knew it. He was with the best team. So Ayrton was at the top level and he had good funding and he knew he was going to be good. Martin went into the year in a different frame of mind. Martin had to redeem himself because he'd been fired in favour of Calvin at the BP Dave Price team by Les Thacker. So he, he thought he'd done a pretty good job in 82, and he had. But obviously the people that could have taken him on again for another year with the same team, same relationships, didn't think that. If I think back, I was just really a hobby racer. I never really dreamed I'd make it to Formula One. I'd done some touring cars. I'd never raced a car. I'd never raced a Formula Ford 1600. I started banger racing old cars around a field just a few miles from where I live in Norfolk. Then I did touring cars. Uh, a local firm had a Formula 4 2000. They asked me to test it. I went well. So then I raced that for a couple of years. We ran it out of the car dealerships. Then I wrote a letter to a guy called Tom Walkinshaw and I said, I'm going to be a top driver one day. Will you please give me a chance? And incredibly, he did in a BMW at a race in Snetterton. And I had a fantastic race and I finished second. And then the next race I won. 
against some international stars. And that put me on the map. Tom then put me in the works Audi that was sponsored by BP. BP took me into Formula 3 in 1982. And that was a tough start. I, I struggled in being, I finished second in my first race in Formula 3. But it was tough, I was out of my depth. Dave Price needed more from me, expected more from me. He's a friend of mine to this very day, uh, is Dave. But uh, he was a pretty tough taskmaster. And my head went mid-season. I started crashing the car unnecessarily. I was off the pace. And suddenly I went to Owen Park one day with nothing to lose. And this would happen a few times in my career. Uh, just drove naturally, won the race from pole by a country mile, won more races for the rest of the season, on pole every one of the last five events, which won me the Grovewood Award for uh, top Commonwealth driver of the year, which was £5,000. Then I lost the BP drive and I had this magic check. Dave Price said, I'm going to send you to a friend of mine. He called him from his office and that guy was Eddie Jordan. So I went straight from Dave's office down to Eddie's house. We stayed overnight. I took my press cuttings and what I had from East Anglian media and the motor racing press. And we, we somehow did a deal, this £5,000 check. We gave him a Citroen Familial estate, a seven-seater off the forecourt we couldn't sell um, from the garages that became the crew car. I painted one of his friend's Toyota trucks myself. I rubbed it down and painted it. So we just kept trying to find value. Silverstone helped us, Tom Walkinshaw helped us. Racing for Britain played a, a key part. And somehow we got together enough money to go racing for the season. So I ended up against this great man called Ayrton Senna in a very unorthodox way, but I was fighting to save my career. But I think in some ways, uh, Ayrton was almost affecting Martin's career even before he drove against him because Ayrton's stock was so high and the BP management led by Les Thack was, was thinking, well, who do we need to put in the car that can go out and compete with Ayrton? And they looked at the 82 season and saw that I was able to um, I think I finished uh, second 15 times in one season. A majority, of course, were to Ayrton. We won four races that year, only a couple of which Ayrton was uh, competing in. But it was, um, it was a long few weeks there at the end of the season, but finally I got the nod and Martin got the bad news that he wasn't selected. I wasn't prepared to just take drivers with money. Uh, I was prepared to take drivers who had the out-and-out -out talent and the obligation of finding the money uh, was down to me. And I always felt that was a much more professional approach. I thought it was going to be better for the overall results of the team. And for sure, I would wind up with better drivers as a result. That is exactly what happened with Brundle. And this contrast, because just as you've got the contrast between the fiery, hot-blooded Ayrton Senna, and he was fiery, and he was hot-blooded, and the calm, deliberate, thinking, Martin Brundle as drivers, uh, you had the calm, deliberative, thinking, very well organized, very experienced Dick Bennett on Senna's team manager and uh, car side. And you've got the highly emotional, vol volatile Irishman in Eddie Jordan, the ultimate wheeler dealer. He's a sort of Bernie Ecclestone with sparks. Uh, looking after Martin Brundle. And the, the, the two lots of two, Bennett's and Senna, and Jordan and Martin Brundle, made incredibly interesting and very different partnerships, which is one of the things that added so much spice and interest to the 1983 season. There's no doubt going into the season that Irish and Senna, or Irish and Senna de Silva, as he was still known in those days, was the favorite. And uh, you could see right away, this guy just was, was a little bit different from everybody else. His focus was so intense. Other drivers that year, Davy Jones came from, from, from the United States. Youngster, teenager, hadn't done a lot of racing, uh, but uh, very, very ambitious, very, very determined. Uh, his father was a, a salty sea dog captain guy and, and uh, very, uh, very much a driving force behind Davy. And Davy kind of, it was an opportunity for him to sort of get out from under, under the old man's shadow, but then the old man was there all the time driving him on. He really was a, a hard taskmaster. Uh, Mario Heighton was another interesting character. He came from Sweden, but a very determined guy. Always seemed to be able to find the sponsorship to do it. He'd raced in Formula 3 the year before, so he was going to be a contender. 
Alan Bird came from Canada. He'd raced for Atlantic cars in the United States and Canada. There was a thriving series over there at the time. He too had set his sights on Formula One and he knew that British F3 was a way to get there. So he came over. He was a, a strong contender as well. Um, and the other major player was Calvin Fish. Calvin Fish was a really, really talented driver. I have no doubt that Calvin could have made it in Formula One and potentially been Formula World Champion. He was that good. His only problem was Ayrton Senna. In the media, um, Ayrton was very clearly perceived as the championship favourite. He'd blitzed it in Formula Ford 1600, he'd blitzed Formula Ford 2000, and there was no reason to imagine that he wasn't going to do the same in Formula 3. I was somewhat annoyed that everybody assumed he would just easily win the championship. I didn't see it that way, but clearly his reputation preceded him. And as soon as we got racing, I understood why the boy was fast and he was difficult to catch, difficult to beat. The early part of Senna de Silva, he was the man. He got together with Dick Bennett's and that partnership just clicked right from the very start. They did a lot of testing before the start of the season. They were prepared, ready to win. Martin Brundle, you know, with his relative lack of experience, uh, was, was a contender right away, but, but not quite on the same level uh, as, uh, as Senna. The other guys in that season, people like Mario Heighton, who had experience already of Formula 3, uh, David Jones and Alan Burke, who didn't, they, you know, they, were, they were competitive, they were running in the top three, they were contending for second, third and fourth. Uh, but the early part of the season was certainly all about Senna and the other guys just trying to catch up and, and learn uh, about you know, what it was that, that made Senna what it was and trying to emulate him. Going into the 83 season, you know, uh, Ayrton was, was convinced he was going to win every race. You know, he was so confident in the fact that he'd got the best package, the best team and the best engineer. No one concerned him, really. I don't think at that stage, Martin Brundle, he didn't even you know, think about the fact that Martin was going to later on, you know, challenge him. Certainly the first round of the championship of Silverstone on the club circuit was an eye opener for everyone. Um, I think for Ayrton, Pre-season testing had gone very well. I think he went into the season with a lot of confidence, expecting to dominate. And after qualifying, there was a huge shock when David Leslie put the uh, magnum on the pole. The first race was actually very funny on a, a strictly personal level, because David Leslie and his wife Jane were great friends of Trisha and I. And I, I remember the moment when Jamie told me David had put the magnum on pole. And it was so unexpected. And I love the magnum. The, the Robinson family did beautiful engineering, and I think they had um, a lock diff. That was one of the little things that they had on that car, so they had pretty good traction. But Ayrton was outraged. He was utterly outraged, convinced that they were cheating because he just couldn't conceive of anybody being better than he was. The second guy was, you know, Martin Brundle. It was at that time, you know, obviously with Martin finished second, that was when uh, he realised that, you know, Martin could be a threat. And, uh, of course, for the next sort of nine races, they finished on the podium. I think for myself, um, you hate to um, take yourself out of the game at such an early stage of the year, but even during that first race, I mean, Silverstone Club's a bit of a dino in terms of seeing what sort of power you have. And uh, Ayrton and Martin ran with the Toyota Motors. Davy and I had the Volkswagen. And it um, seemed like the Toyotas definitely had the edge. You tell them every gear shift, you were losing a little bit with, with the torque of the motor. So I came out of that race, not on the podium. I think we finished fourth in the first one. Uh, but more importantly, I realized this is going to be a long, hard season. Uh, there was some, certainly some good competition that I realized on the day. I realized that Davy was really good. Um, expected Ayrton to be strong, expected Martin to be strong, and then see where we stacked up. And um, I knew it was going to be a tough year, but I think Martin certainly at that stage had the confidence that he was going to go out and win that first race. And suddenly, after qualifying and after the race, he realised, you know, Senna kind of blew him away a little bit. So he looked like he'd been smacked between the eyes, quite honestly. And I, I kind of looked across and thought, get ready, mate, there's going to be more of this, because I, I went through a whole season of this just just last year, so. I quickly learned just how good Ayrton was, how fast he was, and 
and qualifying start, especially on the opening lap of the race, uh, he was very complete and had a sixth sense for how the track was and where the grip was. And it really, it just stopped me in my tracks. Uh, his knowledge, his confidence, how did he know that? Why didn't I know that? And I realized then what a challenge I had on my hands. He was also brutal. We would see this in later life in Formula One. Ayrton would put you in a position to have an accident and he left it up to you on that day in history to decide whether to get out of the way and let him through or have an accident. And once you get that psychological advantage, you're beaten, it's over. And I realized I had to stop that. I had to leave my car in place if I had the racing line, have the accident, show him that he couldn't dominate me and that I could beat him. You know, I do remember one time Martin saying that, you know, this guy's a bit of a megastar. And that was kind of the, the, uh, the only admission that I heard from Martin at some point in time that Senna was, was something special. And of course, all of us at the time saw that this guy was the guy to beat, but you didn't ever really want to admit in your own mind that he's any better than I am, that I can't beat this driver. But, you know, uh, coming into the season, um, I, I viewed all of them as rivals. I didn't really have any, I wasn't, didn't feel any intimidation from the other drivers because I was a race winner myself. I went, went in there with the perspective that, hey, I win races as well. I've won a lot of races as well, too. These guys can be beaten. Uh, and then the second race was at, at Thruxton, uh, the Easter meeting at Thruxton. Uh, and it rained quite a lot that day. And I, I remember that race very well because my one of my mechanics, I won't mention which one, but had forgotten to uh, tighten the bolts for the rear wing flap. And I had practically an IndyCar wing on, on the car, which made me like, you know, really fast in the straight, but it was a handful, of course, especially in the rain in, in the corners. And I remember actually uh, opposite locking at Church Corner, which was quite quite exciting. But I finished third, and I was on the rostrum with Ed and, and Martin, and and I still that's one of the pictures that is on my wall at, at home. You know, my mindset was to win, but I realized that you know that the battle was between Senna and, and Brun. There was times when you could throw a blanket over you know Senna, Brun, and myself, but uh, it kind of through the season it just kind of seemed like it was. It was Senna, Brundle, it was myself, and then it was always like Calvin, Calvin you know, Heighton, and, and so on. Uh, you know, you could put together a fast lap. You could, you could, you know, I could hold my own for a few laps, but, uh, you know, at the end of the race, it was always, uh, you know, Senna and it was Brundle that were, that were battling against each other, and there's just a little bit of gap. The first nine races were painful beyond belief. I, I mean, to finish second in a British F3 race was still good but to be beaten consistently by one man was bad. And I really was struggling to find a way to, to overcome this. But uh, I'm the eternal optimist. My glass is always half full and not half empty. And I still believe somehow that I could beat him. I didn't have his raw skill and history would go on to prove that, but I was fast enough and I was determined. I had to, find a different way. I had to come at it from a different direction and use mm, the skills I had that were better than his. The thing that fascinated me and the thing I think I latched on to very early on was how Martin responded. And instead of giving up Martin, I remember him saying so often, I'm going to do it the next time, I'm going to do it the next time. I I'm certainly partly to blame um, because I think Irish boys uh, in my era, we grew up with a slight inferiority complex. Uh, we were a country out in, in the Atlantic Ocean, so we always felt that the British people were a bit better or the Europeans were better. And I'm sure that probably applied. When you were born in Norfolk, you probably felt you were in the outcasts of Britain. And I think mentally and psychologically, I don't think Martin was mentally as strong as what Ayrton was. Uh, and it took him some races. It took me some races. So uh, together we helped each other uh, to believe. And that's the key factor. Uh, the belief, the understanding, uh, the commitment that you can win, you will win, uh, you must win, uh, but overall that you have the talent to do it. And um, I always fundamentally say first thing about any driver, 
has he got the speed? And that's what Brundle did have. He did have the speed, and it was a matter of putting all of the other little blocks together to make it into a, a very major unit. Eddie was great. I mean, we, we struggle for money. Often when I went to the factory to debrief or have a tweak at the seat or something, I'd have to stop at the Allied Irish Bank and put in £250 or £500, whatever I could find in Northampton. And I remember parking outside it many times. And we, um, we, we, we got through somehow. But where Eddie was so good with me was uh, in my head. He would give me confidence. He would come and sit beside me on the grid and say, you can beat him. You, you're better than him. Uh, I was talking to Charlie Hummingtop and Fred Bloggs. They were out at Stowe and Club this morning. This would be at Silverstone. We had qualifying in the morning. And they said you were faster than him through there. You were better than him. And I trust them. And, and I'm sitting on the grid and thinking, you're right. I can beat this guy. You're right. The turning point of the British Formula 3 season in 1983 probably came down to race 10. It was at Silverstone on June the 12th. And it was a combined round of the British Formula 3 Championship and the European Formula 3 Championship. And the drivers had to choose which points they wanted to chase. If they were running the British Championship, they had to stay on the regular Avon tyres. If they wanted to chase the European Championship points, then they ran the Yokohama tyres. When we went to the European race, which was the pivotal point of the season, um, we actually qualified on Avon tyres for the um, British series in the first session. And Eddie, Martin, and myself looked at each other and said, it's pointless being deep on the grid. We need to be out there winning. So go on, to hell with the British points. Let's, let's go for the race win. And that was when the, the thing began to turn around. I never think it's going to be easy in motorsport because it never is. <laughs> um, but we did have an exceptional first you know, half of the season, first third of the season, won nine out of nine races. And, then the pressure started going on because the question I put to myself was, when's the bubble going to burst? You cannot keep winning every race. And sure enough, we had such a lead, I think from memory, 36, 38 points or something, um, after nine races. It was only nine points to win in those days. So when it came to the Silverstone GP round, we chose to do the open part of the race, not the British part. So same race, but you chose to run open tyres or control tyres. We thought, well, we've got such a lead now, we'll have a, a go at winning outright. So we switched to Yokohama's. Sure enough, we had a little accident. Um, Ayrton swore black and blue there was a puncture. Um, we're not short of the stay. <laughs> um, so that was a, a beginning of a little lean period for us. We stuck the Yokohama's on. I went out, I felt the grip, I felt the confidence. I never lifted the throttle from Beckett's to Cops. So Stowe and Club, absolutely flat out. And I stuck it on pole against a fantastic field of drivers. I led the race and Ayrton crashed trying to stay with me. And that was the moment when I knew I could beat him. And more importantly, he knew I could beat him in a straight fight. And the season turned on its head. Ayrton then did his normal <laughs> at the time in terms of when suddenly he felt he could be beaten, he would even push the equipment beyond the skills that he had to keep it on the racetrack and had and off. And uh, Martin grabbed the pole that weekend, won the race. And that was the first sign of a little bit of a chink in the armor. There was a crack there. I could say, maybe we're onto something here. And of course, the relationship with Brundle and I, and in fact, with all of the drivers, I, I have that, um, I need to have a warm, close relationship with the drivers. I need to be able to put my arm around them. I need to be able to encourage them. I need to be able to convince them that how good they are and even try and convince them that they're better than they are. But you know, in many respects, when the head is strong and when it is clear, and when you actually fundamentally believe firmly and strongly about something, you cannot imagine how much better it is to be able to pull off that achievement. I just remember, you know, after all those nine race wins, how, how upset he was and the fact that, you know, Martin had, you know, finally beaten him. In sport and motorsport in particular, you're either giving pressure or you're taking it. And I was being beaten. I had to somehow mentally get on top of him, somehow show him I could beat him. I could win the races. I could challenge him. 
and he'd better start looking in his mirrors. So fast forward to Cadwell Park, the circuit up in Lincolnshire. Uh, Senna was in pole position. Now, most people would be satisfied with being in pole position, no matter how small the margin. But Senna wasn't satisfied. He thought the margin that he had pole position by was not enough, and he went out again, and he overdid it, crashed the car out of the race. Martin Brundle won it. Points in the bag for Brundle, no points for Senna, and even more pressure on the Brazilian. Qualifying at Cadwell Park, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, 25 past nine, 30 minute session. He came in, he said, the car's pretty good, bit of understeer. I said, we've only got five minutes, quite a long lap. So I just quickly, he said, where am I? I said, well, I've got you on pole from about half a tenth. He said, oh yeah, I can go much quicker if we just get this understeer. So I put half a degree of front wing on, quickly sent him out, and someone timing him around a half of the lap got him much quicker, like three or four tenths quicker, but he didn't finish the lap. He came through a left hand, I forget all the names, and he dropped the right rear over the edge of the track, which took the load off the left front, and when he turned, went to go right, there was no grip. So Ayrton, believing in himself, left his foot on the throttle, thinking it would come right, but there was a concrete marshal post there, so we had one written off Ralt F3 at 28 minutes past nine on Sunday morning, race day. That crash could have been very bad, actually. The, 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 the monocoque was pretty damaged, and, and uh, he could have hurt himself seriously. He was very lucky there. I think the thing with Ayrton was he knew how much effort he was putting in, but he had this evangelical self-belief, and he could never stand it if somebody else was quicker. How could that guy possibly be quicker than me because I'm the best? And it was a little bit like somebody getting floored by another boxer for the first time. Well, that can't be right. He must have a horseshoe in his glove or something. That shouldn't be happening. And he could never rationalize those things very well. I think if someone gets rattled and they're, they lose their focus or they, they overdrive, for instance, um, then it will affect their driving, and he did get rattled, yes. It always got to him. If he didn't win, you know, and something happened like that, it got to him, and he had to analyse it, you know, and he'd sit down with Dick Bennett and go through it and through it and try to understand, you know, why, you know, uh, things went wrong or why they didn't win. I think Dick was so focused. I mean, Dick always believed he knew how good Ayrton was, so if they weren't winning races suddenly, I think he'd have been looking more at, is there a problem with the car versus is there a problem with air time? I probably wasn't quick enough then on the uptake to work on his mind, because being an engineer, I was thinking just the car, the car, but in hindsight now, I'm pretty quick on the uptake now if I think a driver's got a problem, personal problem himself, because if they're not in the right frame of mind, you're never gonna get the best out of them driving the car. At the beginning when Ayrton was winning, and he won those first nine races, you know, and I was writing the press releases. It, it was all, everyone was happy and it was all positive. And then all of a sudden, you know, we had the situation where he got beat by Martin at uh, Silverstone in that European race. And then the next thing, you know, at Cadwell, I had to write a press release, but he didn't want me to kind of put the, obviously the Cadwell mention it, the Cadwell part accident. Then we came to Snetterton up in Norwich. Uh, Martin got an extremely good getaway from the grid and he was ahead of Senna as they came down to the approaching corner. I came out of Sear Corner a little bit sideways and he was on me. So I decided, okay mate, you're going the long way round if you're going to pass me. I'm not going to make this easy for you. So I stayed left all the way down the straight uh, towards the S's, which now ironically uh, has been renamed Brundle Corner. And I left him half a car's width which he elected to take. So he had half a car on the grass and half a car on the tarmac. We touched, the last I remember seeing of him was the rivets in the under tray of his rolt. And he apparently when he landed, kept his foot in it and tried to T-burn me as I turned left into the S's and missed me. We went to the stewards and they found that he was at fault and not me. And he took that very badly. He really felt that 
increasingly the British system was against him. He wasn't only racing a British driver, he was racing against British motorsport. Just like we would see with Jean-Marie Ballest and the FIA and Suzuka in later years. He had this feeling that the world was against him. I mean, Snetterton was a fantastic race. And of course, it didn't surprise anyone. Martin's home race didn't surprise anyone that they collided. And I remember Martin telling me that he could see Ayrton was going to try and have him off. But what I remember of it is Martin's face when he walked up the pit lane afterwards. Let's just say I know guilt when I see it. It was very funny. And of course, I guess most of the marshals were local boys and I think Ayrton probably felt he got stitched up. I actually agreed with that. I could see why he felt like it was me against Britain. And that kind of goes back to, um, I think it was a test session at Silverstone that I went to. And I remember doing an interview, the first proper interview I did with him. It was cold and Ayrton had his red overalls. He was leaning against his silver Alpha suit. I was just chatting away and suddenly, you know, there's this guy that was sort of the yardstick and so dominant and you just think this guy's got everything sus. And he actually came across as, even then, pretty charismatic, but very lonely. And I felt immensely sorry for him because, you know, everyone thought because he was winning everything, he must be so self-confident and, and in the car he was, but out of it, he felt he was homesick and he was just this young kid that was out of his depth um, socially and emotionally. And it was quite an insight into the way they had thought. So I could understand when it got to Snetterton. I do think he got a little bit stitched up there, probably. After awards, I wasn't even thinking anything about the accident because it was very, really incident, a uh, racing incident. But somehow the stewards uh, decided it wasn't. And uh, I was very disappointed because what they have done to me on at this day, at that day, was a very unfair um, decision. And I felt again that I am I am in England racing against for Britain, racing for Britain. Okay, I I even told to Dick uh, we had to take a lot of care and just make the things different. We couldn't afford anymore to be close to him because anything that could happen would be our fault for sure. And they, they would get us maybe with disqualification and take points for us because I, I must say, I feel, I feel that the things had been changed quite a lot around here. And uh, if we are not very careful, they, they will do everything to take away our, our championship. And that incident at Snetterton, uh, I think was a bit of a, a, a turning point in terms of the fact that Ireton suddenly thought, this isn't quite going the way I, I, I thought it was this season. I thought it was going to be a walk, a, 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 you know, walk in the park. The, the p first part of the season was, now I'm being beaten, I'm making a couple of mistakes. Why is that happening? Why is this happening to me? And it, it, it compounded the Brazilian's belief that he wasn't just racing against Englishman Martin Brundle, he was racing against England and the whole vicious system that England had got to penalise him. Yeah. I, I think he's a very good driver, he tried very hard, very concentrated, has a very good car as well, like I have, and Dave as well. But the way that people around him are dealing with, with us is just a joke and uh, that that doesn't uh, make me feel happy at all like the way that they are doing it's just very unfair you know, just a joke unfortunately he is the one involved with that okay but nothing against him as i said nothing personal against him it's just he is the opposition like that he's the comp competition and the things happens to happens between us, we too. But I'm uh, uh, coincidence. One steward was the same on both on on three occasions. Was the same steward one of them. <coughs> and as far as I know, 
Don't ask me how, but I know he was the one pushing hard for giving me the problem on all the occasions. I have no doubt that with his incredible skills, Ayrton was a man driven by his heart rather than his head. He was a passionate man about life, about motorsport and everything around him. So that, that was his source of energy, in my view, compared to some others that might be more mentally driven. And so that was clear to me. And therefore, controlling Ayrton's emotions would have been Dick Bennett's biggest challenge in the second half of the season. As that lean period went on, he had two or three accidents whilst running second to Martin. And I think it was getting to Ayrton's mind as well, and mine, because I'm thinking, we're going to lose this championship. Uh, I had to sit him down a couple of times and explain to him finishing second. And if he could luck into fastest lap, that's seven points, six plus one. He's only getting nine, so we're only losing two. But Ayrton being Ayrton didn't want to finish second. so. He would have an attempt at a pass that didn't come off, so uh, another damaged F3 car. So it was tough going for a few weeks. This didn't fit the Ayrton vision of the world, because, hang on a second, he's not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be first. And he'd, he'd carry on just pushing and pushing, because in his own mind, he thought, well, if he can go that quickly, I must be able to go that quickly. And he'd just push harder and harder and harder until, until he hit something. So he had um, Silverstone, where Senna was quite clearly put out. Uh, we had Cadwell, uh, we had Snetterton, uh, and now we had Alton Park up in, up in Cheshire. Uh, and what Senna did to Martin Brundle at Alton Park uh, was absolutely outrageous because he dived into a gap that wasn't there and Martin had resolved at this stage of 1983 not to be bullied by Senna and not to give way and allow the Brazilian to force his way through. And Martin stuck to his line. Senna hit him. Senna's car landed on top of Brundle and it is an absolute miracle that Martin Brundle was not killed, did not leave this earth at that time. You know, they were very, very close. And Martin at that race was, was you know, more or less ahead. Well, he was ahead, he was, he was leading him. Ayrton had been following him, following him lap after lap and lap, you know, and he had to make that decision at Foster's to uh, dive on the inside. And uh, it didn't work, and landed on top of him. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, that was that, that was when, that was the lowest point of the season. I think by Alton Park, it was obvious that Ayrton was under a lot of pressure because here's this kid, he's come in expecting to do well in Formula 3 and he expected to win and he did and he had that great start. Then suddenly this upstart kid for some ratchet little team, which is the way he probably looked at Egypt, was doing the unexpected and putting him under pressure. And it was obvious that something was going to have to give way. You know, Ayrton was not the kind of guy that was going to sit behind anyone. And he had to learn that I wasn't going to jump out of the way. I was ready to have a crash with him. And that was the only way to treat him because they were the rules that he operated by. And that's fair enough, I'm not, I'm not critical of that. He was a tough guy. And when you get to that level in any sport, that's what you're up against. Immediately after that race, I trudged back to the paddock to find both of them to see what, exactly what had happened. And I found them both standing outside at the bottom of the stairs near the steward's office, like a couple of naughty schoolboys. Um, but they were chatting in a very, very civil, I mean, I, we had a three-way conversation. Uh, and they were chatting in a very civilised way. I mean, Martin was annoyed about what had happened, but I don't think he was bothered about the impending meeting with the stewards, because I think he knew pretty well that you know, he wasn't going to get any hassle. Yeah, I had to sit him down more than once. I thought the first time, being an intelligent young lad, he'll take it on board, but he didn't. It still had another accident. And again, I, you know, I think he took it on board the last time that the championship was getting very close and to the point where we actually entered the last round as second in the championship was frustrating for us. We had to put a number two on the car and not leave number one on. You know, it's difficult you leave Sao Paulo as a very young boy, having been a brilliant karting 
uh, driver and, and a champion in all of the junior categories and suddenly you're in Formula 3 in a strange country. Um, you, you don't, your parents are away, your friends are away and you're sitting in digs in, in, in Norfolk. So what else are you going to do all day when you're not driving the car? You, you think and you think how the forces are out there against you. Um, I think it's quite a normal thing to do. So it's always a difficult balance. I think foreign racing drivers or racing drivers in general have to find another way of making sure that they fill their time with constructive things. Well, I think for Ayrton, I mean, coming over to the UK was a big thing for him. I mean, he loved his family. He loves Brazil. And to make that move and be in the cold of England, he didn't like the cold climate. You could see he was uncomfortable standing in pit lane, uh, just the frigid temperatures. Um, he loved the racing. He loved the thrill of being competing and obviously doing what he was doing. But he wasn't that comfortable, I felt, initially at least, being based in the UK, he'd have much preferred to be home with his family in Brazil. So he's making the ultimate sacrifice. So in the height of all this sort of battle between Ayrton and Martin, Eddie decided to take Martin to Austria for the support race of the Austrian Grand Prix. Now, Dickie didn't like any of that stuff because it was, to him, a distraction. You'd have to set the car up for different tyres and everything else. But this was Eddie's chance to take Martin to the Formula One teams and to showcase what he could do. And I remember Brundle going to the race there uh, and Brundle in the Jordan beat Helmut Marko, who's the guru now of Red Bull, of course. Um, and his driver was Gerhard Berger. And it's funny how you now look back and you don't think anything about it at the time. Um, but lots of these people, lots of these names still around, still very cool guys, uh, know exactly what's going on. They've got racing in their blood and their DNA. And um, we went there for a couple of reasons. We went to take him away from the British, just the British Championship. Uh, we'd seen what he was able to do at the uh, European round in Silverstone when he beat Senna, and then to go and beat Berger. So this was all a matter of putting brick after brick after brick, preparing Brundle for the huge fight mid-season and towards the end of the season, where we felt we had uh, the upper hand or gaining an upper hand over Dick Bennett and Ayrton Senna. We won the race easily against some great competition like Gerhard Berger. My wife overheard Jackie Stewart saying to Ken Tyrrell, you know who looks good in a car? Who looks right to me, who's on his way? That Brundle boy. And, and it was so important to be there and then to have eyes on us. I remember driving back to Vienna Airport with Eddie. We were so happy. My wife Liz was with us. And then I got to the garages the next morning. I'm still selling cars for you know, to pay my bills and my mortgage. And a strange phone call from Eddie. Had I heard anything? No mobiles back in those days. And I said, no, have I heard what? I don't understand what, what you mean. Eddie was very down and I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I mean, I, I remember Eddie phoning us. It must be Monday afternoon, Presto Motion News. Then I realized that Eddie was actually crying. And that was when it was the first I'd heard about the accident. I mean, events post-Austria, really, it should have broken the team completely. Um, after they packed up, some members of the team flew back to the UK. Others went by road with the transporter, and the transporter never made it. It um, crashed en route and tumbled into a ravine. Um, um, Martin's mechanic and great personal friend, Rob Bowden, was tra tragically killed. So then the, the whole Eddie Jordan racing equipe had collapsed. The um, incident in the, in the Austrian mountains was, was a, a tragedy. Um, my wife had to break the news to, to, to Rob's wife and it was, um, the accident was akin to an aircraft disaster. The truck had gone down a ravine and it was just pieces. Um, it was, yeah, a complete and utter disaster. Um, between picking up the pieces of what was left of a Formula 3 team, um, picking up the pieces of lives which were torn apart by that accident, um, it, was a, it was a grim task. And it's only then that you realise that um, human endeavour, human friends, uh, people around you, all sorts of different people. I remember Tim Clues, um, a very strong insurance broker, 
uh, um, Ron Tarnack, the owner of Rolf Cars, and everyone came um, all united um, and money was never discussed. Uh, we were all overcome with the grief and the, and the pain that this was causing. Um, in, in Rob's case, of course, particularly. But we all knew that it would be Rob's absolute desire that we must continue to fight because we were part of that fight. Um, and suddenly a new car arrived and um, uh, it needed to be sorted out afterwards in terms of its payment. But um, Ron Tarnack was simply amazing. He made the car in a very short period of time. Two weeks after that dreadful crash and disaster at Austria, Martin lines up at Silverstone for the next round of the championship, Formula 3. Senna's in pole position. Senna won the race. Martin finished second. But Dick Bennett protested Martin's car um, because of uh, what he believed to be an aer aerodynamic imperfection. The skirt was too low. Um, but I love Dick Bennett. He's a, he's a fabulous bloke. And one of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, but some people would say that that was a pretty harsh thing to do when Eddie and Martin had been through what they had been through. But I'm sure the response would be, look, we're, we're in it to win. And we thought the car was illegal. So we protested it. Right? I think that just showed how tense everything was getting. You know, this was super high level competition for big stakes in the category that the people in Formula One were watching. So you weren't going to let something like that go by. I don't suspect that the usual standards of preparation had been applied to all the cars. And I'm sure that a protest to protest the, the height of the, the, the skirts was perfectly valid because it probably was a couple of millimeters low. But given the circumstances of what we'd come through, um, it's perhaps understandable that it should be or could have been overlooked. It, it would be fair to say that um, Dick Bennett would be a, a much more pure uh, racing person than I would be. Um, by that I mean uh, everything had to be perfect with the car, there could never be any compromise. Uh, with me I was always up to tricks. I was always into the psychology, I was always trying to get inside Dick's head, saying things, doing things, um, telling him my engine was much better than his, that I had a pet Vizani, which was absolutely nonsense, but eventually it drove him crackers. And even after that crash with Rob Bowden, the very next race, uh, you know, reality set in because I remember uh, Senna not being happy and getting Dick to protest our car um, because the skirts he believed were too low, which we used to lower in the paddock so as he would think they were lower, but on the track they were legal and we used to put covers over it and just drive him completely around the, the, the bend. But what we were doing was actually, we were moving his mind away from what he was brilliant at, in other words, working his car. I needed, him, I needed to scramble his head and I could see that this was working um, because um, there was not necessarily unpleasantness, and there certainly wasn't any uh, unsporting behaviour, but I could see that there were issues, big issues occurring that we, we were playing, and it was playing to our advantage. And um, in my opinion, in sport, you do what you can to win. We never cheated, in, to my knowledge, in that respect, um, but we did flaunt and uh, circumvent rules where we could, uh, within the rules, and uh, we made sure that it was obvious to the other side um, that we were up to anything and everything. Aerodynamics, the lower you can run your skirts to the ground, the more it seals the air underneath, it gives you more downforce. We've tested them low um, quite again. For us to visibly see it, they were visibly low, which then means that's quite a bit. It's not one millimeter. And we thought, hang on, what's going on here? Because what you used to do, and the cars are sitting on a grid, you could go along or put your foot under it. And you knew by what shoe you're wearing, how far your shoe would go under the skirt. 
Well, hang on, that's that's a bit low. We, we were all trying to understand this, uh, and there was lots of talk about, uh, you know, bump rubbers and different springs and so forth. His skirts were, in my opinion, much closer to the ground than, than uh, Big Ben and Scar. Certainly after the race, it seemed like something was a little bit amiss, so... I think Eddie came up with a story that someone had fallen on the car. Edson got wind of it and said, this is not right. It's either black or white in terms of it's legal or it's illegal. Anyway, end of the day, Martin kept his points. And again, for Edson, it was another example that everyone was against him. He's the South American, the Brazilian boy over here competing against British guy in 2000 with me, competing against Martin, racing for Britain, supported both of us. And, um, there may have been some uh, favoritism towards us. Uh, I don't really see it that way. It was just, that was the intensity of the championship. I'm sure everyone did the right thing. They did several measurements in different spots. No one of them was good. And both sides were down, not only one side. Both people were there watching all the time. They lift the car up, you know, that much from the ground, which is not perfect at all. Eh? And no one measurement was good. So the, the, the scrutiny years after all, had turned down the car, you know, had disqualified his car. And then Eddie put a fuel with a very smooth way, okay, and the stewards then a very long meeting, somehow decided that the car was legal. How, I don't know, obviously, because it is a simple measurement, four centimeters, nothing to be discussed. It's in or out, it was out for the, the scrutineers, okay. And then the steward somehow decided it was in. Uh, apparently, as he has said, that when I sprayed the champagne, one photographer went over his car, over Martin's car. He put even a witness, which was from Kingsley. Uh, coincidence was a um, uh, journalist, which was doing a piece on Martin. And he was then the, the witness that some, someone had dropped into the car when I sprayed the champagne. But they just, you know, Play a role. They are they are not playing ser serious serious job. You know, they are joking. That's not not so good. I must say. And if things were done fair and square, they should be out, not lose 18 points, as the rule would say. Three three times what you have done. I don't think that's fair. But the, uh, the points from those for that day they should lose. And we had the championship already in hand. That's not the way to win the championship, but it's roads. If you have roads, you must follow. Otherwise, you know, as, well, as one of the stewards, after all, said to me, well, but wasn't that far out. It was a bit low, but not that much. doesn't matter. If it's a bit low, it's low. Four centimeters. If the car at the balance is one kilo below, it's out, okay? And if your airbox is half millimeter bigger, it's out. Otherwise, why, why should you have roads? Oh, what I mean is they, they are just pushing, pushing, pushing to try to disturb you and try to take some advantage on that when it gets a critical moment, you see, because when pressure just build up, build up, build up and cannot help at all. Once I got it in my head I could beat him, I started qualifying on pole. My starts were great. My race craft was strong. And he got into a pattern of either beating me or crashing. He couldn't finish second. It didn't compute. He couldn't work out why I was suddenly beating him, why I, it, the tables had been turned and how I was doing it. And I think that's the mind of a great champion. It's inconceivable that somebody in the same equipment can beat you. We had some supreme fights as well. Donington, I remember very well when uh, we were literally nose to tail for the entire race uh, and I won and that was a very important day for me. It wasn't about him crashing, it was about me outperforming him uh, head to head and so key moments like that just kept building my confidence. The best race, the most exciting race I think I've ever seen and it sounds stupid to say it, was the Formula 3 race at Donington. Martin got in front and had Ayrton behind him and you never knew when the move was coming. And it was literally spellbinding. A two horse race, sounds funny to say, it was the best race I've ever seen. 
there wasn't any overtaking, but it was that constant on the edge, is Ayrton going to do it? And he didn't. And the fact that he didn't, and he didn't find the way to do it, was fascinating because of the psychology that was building up by then. Suddenly we had a race for the season, we had a race for the title. So, after the fiery Brazilian and the laid-back Englishman had been fighting each other wheel to wheel, shoulder to shoulder, toe to toe for the, the whole season, we come to the last race of the season at Thruxton. Martin Brundle was actually leading the championship by one point, one single point, but there was a big but, and that was that he had to drop his best three scores. And after he had done that, in order to win the championship, he needed to win the race from pole position with the fastest lap to get the maximum number of points. And we were in this incredible situation that we never thought we were going to be in at the beginning of the season, you know, where uh, Martin's leading the championship and he could actually win it. Ayrton was livid, but, uh, you know, he knew he had to win it. So he, would, he was going to be doing anything he could possibly think of you know, to win that race and win the championship. So one of the first things uh, he did, which helped him win that race, was to, uh, him and Dick had a chat. And, you know, Dick Bennett said, you know, we've got the car set up perfectly, but it's the engine that we're not sure about. So uh, at that time, Ayrton, who had uh, obviously been living in Italy during these karting days and spoke Italian, contacted, you know, the engine makers at Nova Motor. And, and, and said, look, you know, I really want to see my engine being worked on. I want to, you know, basically, if possible, bring it down, make sure it's all tuned up by you, and then uh, bring it back to England. This was when we were scratching our heads. How come Ayrton's a very intelligent guy? He's not losing his ability. Martin's confidence is probably rising, so maybe the car's a bit better. They've found something. But visibly, we couldn't see anything because we're always eyeing up each other's car when you're on the dummy grid or that. Then I used to walk around all the cars and have a good look at the front wing, rear wing, skirts, um, anything you could see visibly, but nothing. Uh, we had a few little aerodynamic tweaks on our car through help I got from a couple of mates in F1. We had no wind tunnel work. It was just like, if that works on F1, well, it must work on our little ground effects car. Um, but it was then, a few weeks later, we'd learned that Eddie had been pretty clever and got a engine back to Nova Motor and had an upgrade done to it, which we were totally unaware of till just before the last race meeting. So we hurriedly took our engine out. Um, Ayrton took it out himself, spent four or five days at Nova Motor. They rebuilt it and come back, and then the last race was just unbelievable. But that period Martin in the middle, that lean period for Ayrton was, I think it was getting to Ayrton's mind as well. There was no doubt that I, I was feeling uh, quite good about the fact that uh, Senna had very strong views about, we put it out that we felt that our engine was significantly better than Dick Bennett's engine, which we made sure it got back to Ayrton. He felt that he, mentally uh, and physically, um, he, he was a, a far better driver, in his opinion, than anyone else on the grid. And he could not accept or couldn't understand why somebody in a car that hadn't the same love and attention as Dick Bennett's car, well, that's what we used to try and put out, and, um, and he was a better driver in his view than anyone else. So how could this car with Brundle and Jordan be possibly beating him? What are they doing? Are they cheating? Have they a better engine? Have they got better tires? Have they got this, that, and the other? And you know, you can't explain that, but that is often the case where you have real greatness, and Senna had that, where the mind is looking for all sorts of other excuses to explain why. So, for sure, because both being in the same RT3 routes, it's easy to look at the rear wing angle to see how much downforce you got, and of course downforce gives drag. We had to run less wing to keep up with Martin in a straight. That's when we rushed back to Italy with Ayrton and um, came back with a, a, a much stronger engine. 
So whether it Eddie's or Martin's was different or not, but I still believe to this day that it was. It really annoys me to this day when it's suggested I had some kind of engine power advantage. We were side by side, nose to tail, so many times through the season. I never sensed any advantage for me or for Ayrton. There was um, a change in the Pedrazzani Toyota engines. I suspect it was about mid-season and the, so far that there was a development engine with belt-driven cams rather than chain-driven cams became available. And whilst it was an upgrade to the engine in terms of durability and in terms of um, ease of maintenance, it wasn't necessarily a performance advantage. That's dictated to by the injection system and the, the combustion chambers and the restriction set upon Formula 3. The way the cams are driven really doesn't matter as long as they're in the right place at the right time. But visually, the engine looked very different, therefore shinier and newer, and of course, very much more attractive to any driver um, who saw it in the back of the car. Uh, all I can say is when we got our engine back from Nova Motor, it was a different engine, much crisper, much sharper. Where Dickie was so clever with the car, I thought we were equally as clever with the antics and the skullduggery, but that's what makes life so much more interesting and so much more fun. There was quite a lot of pressure going into that last round at Thruxton because I was now leading the championship. I was no longer the hunter, I was the hunted in that respect. But Rolf, through the boss Ron Turanak, had decided, being an engineer that he is, <laughs> to dish out some development parts for the last round, which seems even crazier today than it did back then. And Dick and Ayrton got the side pods, and it's an aero circuit. And Eddie, Alistair and myself got a push rod front suspension, which needed some development. And it was no good. It was not the right thing to throw on. We took it off to, to have at the last round. So I went into Thruxton very much on the back foot, but not as much even as I realised. It was only afterwards I began to understand more the... Uh, ramifications, the importance of the pieces that Ayrton had. For the final round, uh, Thruxton, we, we pride ourselves in preparation, but I think on that particular occasion, um, I think we rebuilt the car twice. We rebuilt it, check everything, double check everything, triple check everything, fresh engine in. Uh, we went to Snetterton for a test. Surprise, surprise, Eddie's there the same day with Martin. We're at one end of the pit lane, they're at the other end of the pit lane, but obviously we're timing every lap we do. <clears throat> so straight away in the morning with the fresh engine, standard bodywork, we were quicker than Martin. But then you think, well, are they really trying? What tyres have they got on? Good tyres, old tyres. Just before lunch break, I put the new side pods on. Ayrton went out. He didn't go much quicker, but he came in and he just smiled. He says, wait till we've had lunch. You'll see after lunch. What do you mean? He says, those side pods are fantastic. I said, oh, OK. I said, you haven't done it. I said, no, no. He said, I can feel the downforce. The balance of the car is better. And I haven't pushed yet. So, OK. It was equal the time we had done, so had a bite of lunch over at the cafe, come back out, first run after lunch, warm the car up, put on a better set of tyres, go. And he just went much quicker again, so I thought, okay. Why would uh, they come out when you've got, you know, a, a championship like this at stake? Why would you come up with a couple of development pieces and give it to a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of different drivers? Why would you not make it available to both the drivers or, or the whole field? So yeah, something strange went on there that uh, you know, leading up to that race, that's, that's for sure. In my opinion, um, aerodynamics was more important at Thruxton. So if you can back the wings out and get the downforce from the underbody, you're getting it for nothing effectively. Uh, for Ron to dish it out to the teams separately, no, that was a bit unfair. Dick and Ayrton were also smart enough to work out. They could gain some advantage by bringing the engine temperatures up earlier. So they blanked off the radiator and Ayrton's job a few laps in was to take the tape off the radio. So I remember looking at him weaving around down that final back straight before the chicane at Thruxton. 
and he'd undone his seatbelts a bit, loosened them off, and was taking the tape off with the car and he was steering one handed. I mean, very clever for performance, but very risky at the same time. I kicked myself because it could have cost us dearly. What we didn't anticipate was the speed you arrive in. I said, the only place you really do it at Thruxton is between Church Corner and the chicane, because it's the longest straight. So you can lean out, pull the tape off. But of course, the speed we're doing at Thruxton, the tape was pushed hard down against the side pod, but he had to get that tape off because it would have cooked the engine. So it was, you know, we had a laugh about it Sunday night, but that could have been a very expensive we probably didn't need to do it but we're just trying to find that extra little bit again to get him you know that first lap of the race just give him that gap to martin so those technical factors meant i wasn't going to win the race i didn't really show up that day but there was more to it there was a big crowd a lot of expectation huge anticipation for the showdown that never really happened because i couldn't stay with them i remember sitting on the grid and this big man who used to run trucks that called sid offered came up and we're moments away from starting this big race and he's pointing at me and shouting no monkey business I don't want any monkey business from you and what he was referring to was years earlier when Rupert Keegan won the championship by simply driving Bruno Giacomelli off the road getting out putting his arms in the air and celebrating and I could have done that with it I could have faked a uh, you know, locked brake and taking him out would have been down at the complex on the first lap and taken the title. I wish I'd have done it now, really, honestly, um, because, you know, I would have won the British Formula 3 Championship. That's what people would have remembered and, and the style which you won it less so because it was over a season. So there you go. It finished in the right way. It finished in a sportsmanlike way with the right guy in front, but both of them really making a name for themselves and showing themselves as clearly as Formula 1 material. There was a lot of pressure on us because, you know, having won the first nine races, they'd never had quite a lean period. And then to have to put number two on the car for the final round, um, I already had a number one ready to go on straight after the race. And we were quietly confident. But it was, yeah, just such a, a relief of pressure. I and mean, we had a, a very long late night, and Ayrton parents were there. and. Um, Keith Sutton, photographer, was, but no, it was a, a, a hell of a relief to, because we knew he could do it, we knew sort of we could do it, but it just had that lean period which made it tough for everyone. I think that 1983 season, Senna kind of grew up. He, he had it kind of easy the first couple of years in F1600 and F2000. Uh, certainly in F2000, there was really only one other driver who, who was with him, and that was Calvin Fish. And then in Formula 3 in 1983, uh, there was really only one driver who pushed him on a regular basis, and that was Martin Brundle. Um, but I think he learned a lot about himself, because in the middle of the season, all of a sudden, things began to go pear-shaped. And he began to question himself, he began to question the stewards, he began to question, you know, the ho everybody was against him. And it was a real persecution complex. Uh, and I think at the end of the season, particularly his mum came to watch that last race at Thruxton, and, you know, he was kind of at peace with himself once more. He learned so much, I think, from from Martin Brundle, the way he approached the sport, the way that it wasn't necessarily all about me, about Senna. You know, there were other factors in there to, that came to play as well. You know, the relationship with, with Dick Bennett, the fact that, you know, other guys were able to, to come along and challenge him. It realized that he wasn't going to be that easy all the way through his career and that uh, he was going to have to continue to work hard about it. So the British Championship had been run and concluded, uh, but the British Championship wasn't the biggest and most important Formula 3 race of the year. That was, and always has been since it began, at Macau, near Hong Kong. You know, the, the, the race series moving to Macau uh, was, was really just, I think it was one of the highlight uh, kind of race weeks of, of my career. Uh, you know, I remember all of us, uh, you know, there was two airplanes that, that left, uh, you know, Heathrow to, uh, to Bangkok and then from Bangkok it did to Hong Kong. You know, the swan song, so to speak, uh, of every season and uh, in some people's view, the cash cow, because uh, everybody wanted to do the race in Macau and there was usually a decent budget from a driver or sponsors or to make up things like that. Um, and I, I was fortunate, um, Teddy Yip uh, um, was, uh, 
an amazing race fanatic and he had uh, a big commercial activity in Macau and indeed Hong Kong. And I was asked to put together three cars. Um, so I naturally chose uh, a Brundle. Uh, another driver who was very strong that year was Roberto Guerrero from Colombia. And um, of course, you couldn't go anywhere without Ayrton Senna. So therefore, I asked Dick Bennett, could West Surrey Racing join with Jordan? Um, and I said, Dick, you'll run the engineering side and I'll run the commercial side. And of course, Dick naturally um, very apprehensive about me running the financial side. <laughs> so whilst I wasn't, of course, engineering the car, nor was I doing it with Brundle either, but to be part of the team, which was the last race that Senna had, um, in a Formula 3 car and to be on the winning side of that, uh, although Dick Bennett will take all the credit and so he should. People often ask me what's my favourite track, expecting me to say Spa, Silverstone, Monaco, Suzuka, which I love, but I always say Macau because it's Monaco and Silverstone bolted together. It's an incredible track. Fast around the reservoir and then up through the streets and it was a great pleasure to go there at the end of 83. In Teddy Yip's team, three cars, Guerrero, Senna, Brundle. We used to move the barriers out of the way to get out of his special garage. I just adored the place. I was very quick on day one. Somehow ended up third on the, on, on the final grid. But of course, the man who won and just poured a little bit more salt into my wounds was it and, uh, with a brilliant drive. That, that weekend was a weekend. It wasn't a weekend. It was a whole week. Um, it was very special too because... Ayrton didn't come with the, we all went on the same flight, except Ayrton, because he was testing the Brabham at Paul Ricard, and we all knew that. So there was lots of speculation on what would, would actually happen with, with him. We all thought, okay, he's obviously landed the drive with, with Bernie Eccleston, with Brabham. Uh, and when he finally arrived uh, that night, he, he was in a very relaxed mood and so forth. And we went, a group of us, we went to, I, I don't remember where it was, but we went to some kind of nightclub. Ayrton was actually doing one of these Mexican drinks where you shake them and then you drink them. And and I, I was watching this and I thought, what? He's, tomorrow is practice kind of thing, you know? No one had been to this fantastic street circuit, Macau, you know, four miles long, incredible, windy, bumpy. All the other drivers had walked around it on the, They'd all arrived on the Sunday before the race weekend. Ayrton didn't arrive till, I think it was midnight Wednesday night. Never walked the track and did a pretty good job. Stuck it on pole position like we all went, where did that come from? The event at Macau um, was a world away from the British scene. The people may have been the same, but the event was was totally different. Out the back of the pits then was uh, a little dwelling with pigs and it was mud and pig, uh, pig or whatever. The smell was wonderful. God, we were busy working on the cars, but I think the drivers and the um, sponsors, they had fun in the town. It was a big party during the, the whole time and there was one evening that uh, Senna, Joe Stoop, and I ended up hanging out together at a hotel, drinking in a bar. And, you know, Ayrton was drinking vodka. I ended up and left, but he got, you know, pretty hairy, pretty crossed up that, that night with, uh, with Joe. Racing at Macau is, is the best thing I've ever done. Uh, and, you know, I grew up dreaming of one day racing on the Nürburgring, uh, Nordschleife. Uh, I never did. I dream, dreamt of doing the Targa Florio in Sicily. I never did but I did Macau. The Macau victory, I think, winning the British F3 with Ayrton was fantastic for sure, but I think winning Macau with Ayrton, with all the other top drivers from Europe, was another um, memorable occasion. But my final abiding memory of Senna and Brundle at Macau in 83 is that when Senna stopped his car, he got out of it, and ran straight to a telephone to phone Bernie Ecclestone, for whose team he had just tested, to tell Bernie that he had won at Macau because he thought that this would beneficially affect 
Bernie Ecclestone's attitude towards him. Because of the time difference, I should think it was probably about three o'clock in the morning for Bernie Ecclestone, who wouldn't take him very kindly to being woken up in the middle of the night. But it's an indication of just how intense Senna was. Well, certainly any form of three season can be make or break. And for the little group of us this year, it was certainly make or break uh, different examples. Certainly, Ayrton got the opportunity with Tolman. Uh, Martin moved on to Formula One as well with Tyrrell. Well, I think when I look back on the season, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't have fond memories because I felt like we got our butts kicked every weekend. But um, I think we finished on the podium in like eight or nine races out of the 20. So it wasn't a disaster. But when you're trying to make it to Formula One, you need to be winning races and winning the championship. So at the time, it was a complete disaster. It, w it was actually good for me. You hate to see your career stall like it did, but it enabled me to regroup, um, realized how much I loved the sport, how much I wanted to get back in, how hungry I was, and then reestablished my career in the US and had a few successful years over there and uh, now involved in the sport from a you know, TV commentary standpoint. I feel, uh, you know, honored that I was that I was a part of that series I you know I feel honored that that uh, that you know I raced with Ayrton Senna and raced against him I feel honored that I raced against Martin Brundle and uh, Calvin Fish and Alan Berg and Mary Heighton we were all tough competitors and and uh, you know we learned from each other uh, you know the fact that that Senna went on to race in Formula One as well as Martin Brundle that just gave me you know the the confidence that that I could do that in some ways, you can look back and say, well, if Senna hadn't have turned up, I'd have dominated the championship and been F3 champion. Where would that have taken me? I think actually Ayrton being there elevated my career, ensured that I got to F1. There was so much attention on this British F3 championship of 1983. So I have a lot to thank Ayrton for. I learned much from him. I was privileged to race against him over 11 seasons, and I have the utmost respect and admiration for what he achieved that year and what he achieved subsequently. I think 83 changed Martin a lot more than it changed Senna. Senna was always intense, determined, mystical, applying himself to anything and everything that would enable him to win because he believed he was put on this earth to win. And he had that attitude for the whole of his career. He had it in Formula 3, I know from personal observation, and he certainly continued it in Formula 1. I think it's very clear, even at a young stage with drivers, the really, really good ones, they have the mental capacity, not just to drive the car, obviously that's critical, but then there's a vast amount of spare mental capacity to deal with other things, to, to see the bigger picture. Um, to be aware of the other stuff that's going on around them. And, and Ayrton had that massively. I mean, he was just very, very aware, as well as driving extremely quickly. There was a case at one of the races that we ran in later on in the year. Uh, we were at Thruxton. We we're making our way along the back straight, and when we get into the last turn, we all fan out. And uh, I'm kind of on the dirty part of the track. I spin, I make my way through, and I finish the race and then I ran into Senna in the paddock afterwards. And he said to me, I saw that you were in fifth place going into this corner. And then coming into the corner, you weren't there anymore. What happened to you? And I made up, you know, my flimsy excuse and carried it on my way. And I, I thought about it years later. You know, I carried on and I made my living driving race cars for, you know, the next 15 years. But I don't ever recall being in a situation where I'm driving in a race and consciously know where each one of the drivers is positioned behind me. He knew where I was positioned on the track. He consciously knew that. And he knew the moment that I was gone. And uh, to me, it was just uncanny use of his vision. I think Ayrton was always uh, different from other drivers. He was, um, he was a bit of a loner. Um, he didn't socialize a lot. And he always thought he was better than anyone. And maybe he was but he always believed he was. Not just in his driving, but I think in all his approaches to life. You know, he became religious, he had um, different views on life. He was always gonna succeed in whatever he did, I think. But he was a bit like, a lot like lots of powerful people. They always think they're 
They're apart from the rest. They think out of the box. Ayrton was a really great guy, and we saw the humour um, at some points during the season. Uh, but uh, at other points, we took, saw, saw that steely side to him, where he had almost a desperation to win, whatever the cost, and whether it was done by political, technical, or by the racing on the circuit, he'd explore every avenue uh, in order to do that. To me, sports or whatever sort of it is, you compete, you want to win, but if you can win, it's fantastic, but it's not absolutely mandatory to win. And I think he was starting to just go beyond that limit of what I you know, expect as a normal person. But knowing him as I did, you know, he's a very determined person for sure, very talented person, very intelligent person. Um, there's no doubt about his raw talent, but I, I, uh, I did think at occasions he, he pushed it a bit far to, to be, you know, being a, a good sportsman. Away from the racing, a lot of people thought he was a quite a tough, you know, bloke. Which he he probably showed that in racing, but away from that, on the social scene, he was a great laugh, great guy. I saw so many things in F3 that I would see again in Ayrton's Formula One career: his speed on a qualifying lap, his emotionally driven energy, where he started to think the world was against him a bit especially the FIA or Balestra and his ability to have a crash to make a point as we saw against Alain Prost, his incredible sixth sense of grip and speed, his God-given talent, and just everything that mushroomed through his Grand Prix career was there to be seen in 1983. I saw just the same man in F1, but with much bigger focus and a much bigger spotlight. I think it's nice to look back at some of the other stuff that kind of came out of that year. I mean, Martin and Ayrton went on and had fantastically successful Formula One careers, obviously. Davy Jones became a Le Mans winner, as did Martin. Martin became a world sports car champion, Ayrton became a Formula One world champion. So, you know, they both became world champions. Um, Alan Berg had a very long career, he raced in Mexico, very successfully in the Mexican Formula 2 championship for a number of years and now runs driving schools and things. Dick Bennett went on to have much more success in Formula 3 and also in touring cars and is still very involved in touring cars as a works, you know, running works cars for people. Alistair McQueen, who was engineering in Formula 3 at the time, engineered Martin's Le Mans victory in 1990 with TWR Jaguar. Neil Trundle who started off with Ron Dennis, went back to Ron Dennis and worked in Formula One as an engineer on Ayrton's car. So there are all sorts of strands from that season. Um, you know, people remember the obvious stuff, Senevi Brundle, but the people who were involved at the coalface there, between them, they, you know, they, they, they all went on to achieve an awful lot of great stuff. It has to be the best season because it was so intense. There were two of the best drivers that, that have ever come through Formula Three. Uh, from completely different perspectives, from completely different backgrounds, and how the pendulum swung. I mean, he, Ayrton Senna came to be regarded as one of the all-time greats, perhaps the, the greatest driver that ever lived. And there he was in Formula 3 at a, you know, the, at a humble level in the sport, uh, learning his trade. When I come to England in 1981 to participate in the Formula 4 Championship, it was my first season of racing cars, until then it was only go-karts. And uh, I've been through several seasons here in different categories, successfully, fortunately. And uh, lots of the things that I learned and that I subsequently use in Formula One have come from England because here I learned how to race as a professional, I learned how to observe the flags, I learned how to follow the marshals, the starting procedures, the testing procedures, setup of cars. Uh, the relationship with the engineers, mechanics, team owners, team managers, and that um, has made a lot of my personality in terms of motor racing. I'd just like to say thank you to all of those people here in England that have given me the opportunity from 1981 to come through all the way, and in such a relatively short period of time, 
had so much success. Thank you.